Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and broadcasting worldwide on UFCradio.com. And before the break, we are talking about next season of The Ultimate Fighter, Tough 18, taking place. The women's and men division of the 135-pound weight class will be competing against each other. Women's champ Ronda Rousey will be competing, coaching against Kat Zingano or Misha Tate. Phil, I, we were talking just briefly to, to close this up. What do you think about that fight? you got two women on paper who stylistically are very similar. Both high school wrestlers, both wrestled against men, both well accomplished in the jiu-jitsu world. I think when it comes to actual jiu-jitsu, I think Kat might actually have the advantage. I think she might be a brown belt now under her husband, who was a, a world champion black belt, Mauricio Zingano, world-class jiu-jitsu practitioner. Um, both pretty solid on the stand-up. So on paper, they're the same. Unfortunately, you know, we've seen... Misha Tate fighting throughout the Strike Force organization. We've seen all of her fates, fights. We have not seen a lot out of Cat, so it's hard to tell stylistically how they're actually going to match up. But what are your thoughts about this match? I like the fight. I do. And um, I have to be honest. I know you were talking about uh, Misha would probably be, if, if Misha wins, that would probably do well for the Ultimate Fighter because you know the history between Misha and Ronda. But I would really like to see Cat Zingano uh, on the show because th they know Misha. The world knows Misha. Tate, right. okay and that's the one thing and I think that's why we have a split household because the the depth in the women's division right now uh, we've talked about it before um, yes it is the right time for women to be in the UFC but Dana is a hundred percent correct when he talks about it and he says the depth is not there okay so you need to build these people up I think you need people to know who Kat Zingano is Okay, and I think you would build a better fight that way because I think that she, I, I've already seen what Ronda did to Misha, and I, I know it lasted a little longer than with some people, but <laughs> I, I just, I, I look at it and I, I, I'll see the same thing again. You think so? I think I'll see the same thing again. I, I do, I agree with you, and, and Heidi, I want to get you real quick. I agree with you um, only because of interviewing Misha in the past. What she after that fight, what she kind of said was that she wouldn't. Her game probably be the same. She's gonna fight the same. She's it's just gonna do better. You know, I asked her, would you change it up? Would you try to stand up more and keep it standing? And she's like, Nah, I. You know, that's not my style. I'm not gonna change my style of fighting. I would do the same thing. I'd just be more well prepared. And 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 hearing that out of her mind, it's it's almost like you aren't going to make the changes needed to get the W. You know, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to. Uh, what's the, the leopard can't change his skin, or zebra can't spots. change his spots, yeah. or stripes, or spots, stripes. You're gonna have to do something with your damn spots and stripes to beat this chick. Listen, the the definition I believe is uh, the definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. That's crazy, man. It's crazy. So, but that's what that's what I think is gonna happen. So I'd like to see Cat, you know, take this one, be on the Ultimate Fighter, and let's start introducing some new women to the uh, to the world. Plus, yeah, I just wanted to add that like one thing about Cat is she did have her first win by armbar yay <laughs> and she's undefeated so you know that kind of i think the hope of having another undefeated fighter against another undefeated fighter would be pretty awesome if you had ronda and cat together i so. actually commentated that first fight oh did colorado you colorado yeah. fire yeah i've seen a lot of cats fight i watched her come up through the ranks in colorado and dude have you seen her yeah she's a beast dude she's like got like 10 pounds on you phil she i mean she's standing next to you she's jacked she is like uh, uh, you put her next to Misha, and it looks like, you know, a pretty princess versus, like, a ripped-up, you know, muscle. I mean, she is no—and she's, she's she's an attractive lady as well, but yeah. she's just jacked up. That's scary because I am carved up like a Thanksgiving turkey, and if she <laughs> she's got 10 pounds on me, woo. Well, that fight and the next season of The Ultimate Fighter will definitely be history in the making. Speaking of history in the making, Phil, give us this week's— in MMA history. Yeah, see, we're going to start doing this, and I really enjoy it because we're, we're 20 years in, Joey. We are. We are 20 years in. We're on aged us. We, but we <laughs> are. We, uh, we, this I've been is, watching since 93, baby. Absolutely. November 12, 1993, 18 years to the day that UFC finally debuted on Fox, by the way. That's awesome. It's, that is very awesome. But this week in history, uh, Pride 13 took place actually today, March 25th, 2001, in Japan. Uh, historic event. It was actually the very first Pride that they were allowed to use knees in the four-point position. That means you were allowed to knee somebody in the head if they were on all fours. And Mark Coleman was the one who took advantage of it the most, winning, destroying Alan Goes that night by repeated knees to the head. 
you remember that fight? Absolutely. How brutal it was and goes. Remember? He comes up <laughs> and he's crawling and he starts trying to wrestle him after they had already called the fight and he's just still dragging on the floor <laughs> on all fours <laughs> after he was kneed on all fours chasing after Coleman. It was pretty crazy. It, it, it didn't that didn't that rule come into play because of Mark Kerr complaining because Igor Volchanchin the, the was kneeing him in the head mm-hmm. in the vet mm-hmm. before and it was uh, was that the first Grand Prix ever? That, that was, it was uh, such, yeah because Coleman two thousand yes. So Coleman went and uh, later on Volchanchin. So basically, uh, Eagle Volchance and fighting wrestler Mark Kerr gets him down, gets him in an all four point position, starts blasting him in the head with knees. Uh, they st- Mark Kerr can't stop. They call it a knockout. Kim per- Kerr complains that the rules are against, you know, those are against wrestlers. the rules. Wrestlers. And, and, but it was funny, though, because it was against the rules, but it was so classic pride back in the day when there was rule conflicts with pride and you went to address them with the with the officials suddenly they, suddenly they, they didn't speak english anymore <laughs> they're like oh so sorry so sorry you know? they, they were good when contracts no, were no, being no. negotiated yeah, but, but when <laughs> rules are discussed <laughs> ah. yeah. sorry so so then uh volchanchin of course later on goes on to lose to to mark coleman the godfather of ground and pound in the finals and then coleman rides the wave of the new world rule change and completely knees the living brains it was like a walking uh, like a scene from walking dead you know how they yeah. stump the zombies brains out of walking dead that's how coleman uh, was doing goes head yeah it, it was brutal uh also it, igor was on that fight um Vochanson fought that night um Vandale silva Absolutely destroyed soccer Robert the night that night with knees to the head, soccer kick. It was just an absolute onslaught. You also had Dan Henderson knock out Henzo Gracie in the first round with a brutal uppercut on the shot and then a left hand that put him uh, out cold. Two legends fell on the same night. Yep. Yeah. And that was Sakuraba's first, you know, that was his first loss when he, not first loss in his career, but his first loss as the king of pride, the king Absolutely. of Japan, the person, the Gracie Hunter, the Gracie Killer, whatever you'd like to call him. Gracie Killer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was his first loss after he just went through every Gracie in the family, demolished him, was kind of like the, the hero of pride, and here comes the anti-hero, the axe murder, and literally axe murders Kazushi Sakuraba. Absolutely, and also on the very first night of that, uh, very first Fight of the card. You had Vitor Belfort fight. I don't know if you remember Ultimate Fighter Season 1 contestant Bobby Southworth. He was like Koscheck's uh, henchman. (laughs) (laughs) I remember Bobby. Go put a hose on this guy. So, um, (laughs) but uh, yeah, so that was so long ago. 2001 back in uh, uh, March 25th, 2001. Also, March 26th. UFC 111, Dan Hardy lost to GSP by unanimous decision. And we had um, Shane Carwin become an interim champion, beating Frank Mir, who later lost to Brock Lesnar. So that was a, a definitely a fun night. First night I met Mr. Billy Mirror. This is an emotional night. Well, emotional emotional experience. Uh, we also had uh, on uh, UFC Fight Night took place March 26, 2011, where we saw uh, the Korean Zombie use the very first ever twister. In the UFC against, against Leonard, Leonard Garcia. Garcia in a very high, what I thought was a very highly anticipated rematch. Because remember, they fought on the very first WEC oh pay-per-view yeah. that was leading in. That, that fight was straight out of, uh, what was that show on FX for a while? Um, tough, uh, tough Man. Oh. Their fight, that fight for them was straight out tough, man, because they were just, technique left the building. Skills went on vacation. These guys left left everything but their balls and their fists cage side and went to war. Yes, they certainly did, and it was one of the most entertaining fights of the year. And, uh, you know, Zombie took him in the rematch. And lastly, on March 27, 2003, Frank Shamrock made his return to MMA action after a three-year hiatus beating Brian Pardo for the WEC Light Heavyweight Championship. Pre, Pre-Zuffa pre, WEC, pre, pre, by the way. Pre-Zuffa I, WEC. I don't, I don't think uh, Frank <laughs> Shamrock will be there post. And uh, also that night, Nick Diaz won the welterweight title from the WEC using a Kimura uh, on Joe Hurley and making his second Pro fight uh, appearance on that card was also Gilbert Melendez. Wow. So, uh, big week in history. A lot, lot happened uh, this week, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, looking up the rest of past because as I was looking into this stuff, man, it was like a stroll down memory lane. I love it. I love it. Now, uh, going back to, to uh, the Korean zombie, did you see the letter he wrote to GSP? I certainly did. So, so I'll tell everyone what's going on. Uh, GSP at, at, at UFC 158 walked out to the cage, and he's always wearing – Worn a headband with the with the Karate Kid logo the, the on the rising the, sun, the, J- the Japanese sun on its headband. But he had a huge Japanese sun on his gi as well, and uh, I thought it looked cool. I've seen it as 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 Korean Zombie pointed out. I've seen it on many 
T-shirts. I've got a couple of Affliction shirts in my closet, as much as I hate to admit. <laughs> no, I've got a You're couple guy. of Affliction shirts. You know, yeah, they're, but my, mine are loose. They're not skin tight. I don't have barbed wire tattoos and a mohawk. <laughs> not dogging anyone out there that has that, but you guys know who I'm talking about. Um, but I, I have a couple of shirts with with the Japanese sun, the, the and, and the the rising sun in the background, and um, so the Korean zombie he wrote a letter to George St. Pierre saying, "Hey, that is a symbol of hate crimes." Um, this that that is the symbol to the people of Asia because while World War II was going on, I guess it wasn't just you know. And I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not the most educated, you know. I'm not the brightest candle on the cake, you know. History. I think I was out um, testing the Nevada State Athletic Commission's policies on marijuana during <laughs> history class uh, in high school, so I missed all this. But I guess you know the the the. the uh, Japan um, had a lot of hate crimes that they, that they oh, committed yeah. atrocities m very similar to what the, the 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 Nazis were doing in Nazi Germany at the time and so TK basically said to um, or the zombie basically said to George St. Pierre you wearing that is the equivalent of someone wearing a Nazi symbol to, it's the equivalent to the Asian people of someone wearing a Nazi symbol on their gi it, you know, uh, it, it's a touchy subject. Uh, listen, did you it, know about that? Yeah. yeah it, did you know that the, the the flag meant that? There's there's a lot of things that people don't know about. You know, history. A lot of history is left out of the books. Let's just be a hundred percent honest of it. There's a lot of things that people you don't you're not supposed to know about. I mean, hey, it happened here in America against the Japanese with Manzanar. And, and people don't even talk about it. You don't find that stuff in history books. Or about okay. the 442nd Regiment go for broke. Yeah, you <laughs> just don't hear about this stuff. But the thing is... I didn't hear about is, that. Is, <laughs> you know, like, uh, unfortunately, it will stick with them forever. Uh, and it'll stick with Japan and, and their their flag. It's their flag. They're not going to change it. But you, you look at, the, you know, he mentioned the swastika. Uh, the swastika was something that, that Hitler took from thousands of years ago. So it wasn't even originally a Nazi symbol. Right, it's the just Navy been, cross. yeah, it's just been br branded that way. So it's like, yes, I understand. It was actually a Buddhist symbol. The Nazi symbol was a Buddhist symbol. No, no, the, uh, she's talking about the Iron Cross. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which, which oh, okay. Is became, uh, you it know, a white supremacy yeah, thing right, for so right, long. Right, so it's one of those things you just, you know, you have to look into the history of it. J Japan wasn't always like that. Yes, it's m you know from a bad time, but th th it's a Japanese should, flag. Should GSP pull that? No, no, no not no. at all. Well, you, all. you're Japanese American. Right. If you're not offended by it, then, I, then I'm not going to be offended right. by it. And I don't think my grandmother, that was an Issei generation, would have been either. It's just one of those things that you know it happened. It was part of the past, but it's not necessarily that the flag is completely viewed in that way. It's more looked at the rising sun. You know, I'm just. Uh, I guess new hope, new generation. Let's move on, you know? Beautiful. Well, we got to take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by UFC lightweight and MMA royalty, Ryan Couture. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 and broadcasting worldwide on UFCradio.com. on ufcradio.com and and phil this is a historic week because we are launching with ufcradio.com and you know how the ufc does everything they took over pay-per-view they took over tv now they're looking to take over the airways too and we are on board with that takeover and when you have such a historical event you need to bring on a historical mma fighter and who better than ufc royalty taking on ross pearson this weekend on ufc on fuel please welcome to mma fight corner ufc lightweight ryan couture Ryan, Ryan, we're trying for Ryan. 
Hey, Ryan. Hello, hello, hello. We don't have Ryan, but we'll get Ryan is definitely Ryan's on hold. So we're just having a technical difficulty getting him on air. But um, let's uh, let's 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 move forward. What do you think about the Ryan? So so Ryan is fighting this weekend at UFC. Two weeks, Fuel. two weeks. Excuse me. In two weeks. Correct. Taking on the very game, the very tough ultimate fighter. Uh, what season did Ross Pearson win? Uh, eight. I don't know. Hi, Heidi. Fact check Heidi. Okay, Heidi said eight two, but uh, I, I want to know if it's official, like referee with a whistle. So, but but Ross Pearson, he's taking on Ross Pearson at UFC on Fuel, and Ryan's been one of these guys who is is making leaps and bounds in his competition. And I'll be honest, when they first announced him versus Connor Hume, which is the biggest test, I think he was five and one at the time. I wasn't too sure about that. I've known Connor for years. I was his coach on the Anacondas in the IFL. He fought for our team as our alternate, and he is a very game game opponent. And uh, I, I knew Ryan was tough. I knew he was well-rounded. I knew he had skills. I just didn't know what level he was at. And boy, did he show me that night. He came out and demolished Connor. Absolutely. And, and a lot of people were surprised with the way that he did it. Um, you, you're right. That he's making leaps and bounds. And every time that he's fighting somebody, there's a competition. It, it steps up by leaps and bounds. And we talked about his last fight with KJ Nunes. It really showed me something with Ryan. Ryan took a lot of tough, big shots from KJ. No, most guys don't wake up from that. Most guys go right down and they stay down. Ryan took those shots, can't, kept coming, persevered, and won the fight. Yeah, and KJ, uh, KJ, no slouch, former Strike Force lightweight champ, demolished Nick Diaz as a lightweight, picked him apart, cut him open, sliced him open. Um, you know, he's he's a pro boxer. He's got he's twelve and two, and I think he's got like eight or nine knockouts. So this guy has made his living as a boxer and as a mixed martial artist by knocking people unconscious. Um, and and Ryan, like you said, man, he ate the best that KJ had to offer. Yeah, and I and I think that in a fight with Ross Pearson, I think uh, Ryan would be able to, you know. Uh, we saw that he could take the shots, okay, and we know what he can do on the ground. And I think he clearly has a major advantage over Ross on the ground. Uh, if he takes the fight, if he's able to get the fight there, I think it's all Ryan's fight. And, yeah. Oh, Ross Pearson, by the way, fact check, was the Ultimate Fighter Season 9 winner. It was nine, the U.S. Damn. versus the U.K. Dan Henderson one. and Bisping yeah. as the coaches. Oh, my God. Speaking of MMA history, one of my favorite one of my favorite moments in the history of mixed martial arts was Dan Henderson knocking out Michael Bisping. And you know what's funny? We talked about Dan Henderson earlier when he knocked out uh, Henzo Gracie. You see the type of person Dan Henderson really is in the Henzo Gracie fight. He knocks him out. He hits. He sees the punch was landed. Stops. Checks on him. Uh, I think I'm sorry to interrupt you. But I just I think we have Ryan on the line. I want to say hello. Are you there, Ryan? You're no. such a sorry, tease. Sorry, this is, I know. You're I thought Ryan we finally tease. had everyone back, everyone back here is a Ryan tease. Let me just yeah. tell you that. So, but, uh, yeah, and, and Ross, um, uh, Henzo, Henzo. Oh, yeah, Henzo and Dan Henderson. And, and Henzo got knocked out violently. Dan stopped, checked on him right away. Okay. Dan Henderson takes on Michael Bisping. <laughs> he lands that right hand, and then he just throws another shot just to make sure. A superman. <laughs> H bomb, di a diving, flying H bomb that's just stiff, completely. John Matuwood, uh, Michael Bisping. Oh, uh, that is one of the worst. I, I remember the John Matua against Frank, uh, Tank, Tank Abbott, and when you saw Matua hit that floor and those arms went up and legs went up, like that was scary. Oh yeah, that's some bad. scary stuff. But that's how it. Bisping was stiffed. I mean, he was, yeah, you know, oh, oh. his teeth, arms flexing, kind of leg, toes pointing, legs. Legs flexed. Yeah, and, and you saw Dan Henderson really. He wanted to put that emphasis on there because he didn't like him after that didn't, season. Didn't you want to see that, though? Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, though, Bisping definitely didn't make any American fans in that in that season. He uh, was squirting the water in people's faces, you know. Marcus Johnson, didn't yeah. know who he did it to? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Egging on the fighters, talking smack to the other team. Like, he just, I just, every episode I watched, I could not wait for the finale because I thought Dan Henderson was going to knock him out. I'll be honest, Michael Bisping has grown on me. He really has grown on me. I think Michael Bisping's a nice dude, and I think he's a m very underrated fighter. I think uh, I'd, what I'd like to do is uh, I, I I do have to admit, yes, back then I, I was happy to see it. Uh, you know, I was watching that in Radio City Music Hall on a giant 75-foot screen, UFC 100. It's like 3,000 people in there to watch it on TV, and that place erupted when Bisping got knocked out. 
Well, speaking of eruptions, let's see if we can get an eruption of, of, of sound of applause if Ryan Couture is actually on the line with us. Ryan, are you there? Man, I, I don't have any faith in my in my technical, technically deficient uh, team back behind the I, studio. I, I, so. I don't think it's the team. I think it's just it, it's, it's us. I it's think us? it's just us. I don't it's think Ryan wants to talk to us. No, right you know now. what? Actually, <laughs> have you ever talked to Ryan? Dude, I he's, saw Ryan like, Saturday night. He's like this, though. He's, he he's has the same voice of his dad, but just like. 10 decibels lower so sometimes you have to you're standing like like as far we are as, as far apart as we are and you can't hear him you gotta get so he might be on the line we just he might be on right now we just can't hear him he, he is uh he is soft-spoken but uh he's not in the cage no no he's a beast not in the cage at all really looking forward to the fight and i'm actually looking forward to the entire card i mean let's be honest a free fight card on fuel when which headlined headlined by alexander gustafson and gagard musasi I know a lot of the people in the UFC don't know who Gar uh, Gay Guard Musasi is. Dude is a beast, and I think it's such a gr that's such a good fight. Him and um, uh, him and Gustafson. I mean, if if Gustafson tries to stand the entire time with Musasi, it's gonna it might not work out very well for him. You really? I don't think so, man. I think. Do you remember the Mike Kyle fight with, with Gay Guard? Yeah. Mike Mike Kyle was picking Gay Guard apart. He was. It was the footwork and the distance. Gegard was kind of plotting and coming forward and trying to cut him off, and, and and Kyle was lighting him up. I mean, he was doing a great job at that range, using his length, one, long ones and twos, head kick, clinch, knee, one, two, three, and Gegard had to eventually go to the ground game where Mike Kyle was a fish out of water, and he, he took him down, took his back, and choked him out end of the fight in the first round. But that, for me, is the telltale sign of, of, of this fight against Gustafson because if anyone has that style and does it, 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 that Mike Kyle style but does it, great much better than Mike Kyle it's Gustafson he's light on his toes he's long he's rangy he's uh, he's as experienced in boxing as Gegard both amateur champions both national amateur champions I think he has more knockouts on his resume than than Gegard as well and when you have the the golden rule of styles make fights that footwork fighter usually wins over the kind of plodding stock forward fighter yeah, I, I don't I, I don't know, man. I'm telling you. You're leading towards Gegard? I, I'm leading towards Gegard, and I don't know if it's the, um, hey, you know. Yeah, but you were also that, leaning that, towards, uh, um, um, what's his name? You know, the hype train guy, this little guy. The hype train guy? Who, am I Who are you talking about? about, Hector Lombard? <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you knew I was going to take it there. Uh, okay, listen, Hector Lombard, <laughs> Hector Lombard, I am not off the hype train yet. I've, I told you, I'm not off the hype train. I still think Hector Lombard is going to make a, a major impact in the UFC. But... I'm no longer the conductor of the train, okay? okay. I, I'm actually now just Where a are passenger. You, are you still in first class? Are you uh, in coach? Yeah. Are, you at, are you like all the way back at the bar the bar, uh, the bar, bar section? I just got my, my, my ticket checked, and I was sitting in first class, but they realized, whoa, whoa, this guy. You're, you don't belong in first class. So they moved me back. <laughs> so I'm sitting as a passenger right now on the Hector Lombard hype train, but I do believe, uh, you know, he's a real tough dude, and uh, – I think he's going to make an impact in the UFC. And at first, you know, Dana was making those comments how, you know, did I spend too much money on him? Is he worth it? I think he, uh, after the real, the last fight with Okami, I mean, come on, dude. It's, it's Yushin Okami. Let's, let's, it's Yushin Okami. Every, he beats pretty much everybody except for Anderson Silva and Tim, Tim Boach when he's tired because he was laying a beating on Boach. Remember we talked about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, that's, what, why, that's why I picked Yushin. What, what's, going, but what's going on with Yushin in the third round of fights lately? Oh, my gosh. I, I don't know, but, but I want to jump back to the Gegard fight real quick because I, I, I think Gegard's only hope in that is going to be the wrestling. I think he's going to have to try to take it down, and I think that Gustafson spending that time with Phil Davis became a student of the wrestling arts, and he's not the same Gustafson that fought Phil Davis. I think he's got chain wrestling defense, and I know for a fact he's out here in Vegas tra training with Robert Drysdale, and the things I heard about his ground game is that this kid is a beast. He's phenomenal in transitions. He's not, you know, he's not just one-dimensional striker, He's and he's not just a, a, a BJJ guy who's playing off his guard, you know. He, he takes top position. He's got offensive wrestling and defensive wrestling now he's he's a, a different fighter than than he used to be so i think i think all around i, I i'm leaning towards gustafson and i think he's going to win that striking war and i think musashi is going to try to make it into a a uh a, a wrestling match well musashi's changed things up you know uh, I, I think he moved camps uh I'm, I'm really interested to see what he's done and i think i think when you saw after uh the king mo fight you know, uh, the, the the wrestling changed for him. I think Musasi's he was relying too much on his talent, 
And now I think he's realized that, uh, you know, he needs to train with better people. He needs to keep that, uh, the, the evolution going. He can't just rely on the talent that he has. So that's what I'd like to see. I, I mean, that's what I think is going to But I look at it and I just think, I just think it's, it's, a, it's a setup fight. It's a bad setup for Gustafson because all people are talking about is Gustafson getting the next shot. Uh, at, at but they're not, though. They, they are. are. They, they have been. That has been speculated, rumored, but the next shot's Machida. And How uh, many times have we heard that? The next shot is Hendricks, too, right? Ex exactly. <laughs> so what I'm saying is Gustafson's on the radar. I don't think this is as big of a setup as something like the, the, you know, the Ronda fight I talked about or Moe versus Newton. But um, Moe versus Newton, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was definitely a setup fight. Nice. So um, but we're going to take a quick break right now, uh, pay some bills. Uh, you're listening to the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 in Las Vegas, streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. And make sure you check out Dr. Richard Rothman of LASIK of Nevada. All right. Give their website a check out at LASIKofNV.com or give them a call at 702-948-8283. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 and broadcasting worldwide on UFC.com. And I just love saying that it flows off the tongue so well. UFCradio.com. It does, doesn't it? UFCradio.com. Uh, in case you're joining us right now, you missed a lot of great stuff. We've been talking about the, the Nevada State Athletics Commission new step in the direction of reassessing their, their stance with marijuana and maybe allowing for some sort of exemptions. We also touched on the Ultimate Fighter Season 18 going to be coached by women and featured women and men in the same household lots of crazy stuff but right now we'd like to get into Heidi's hit list ready for MMA news it's time for Heidi's hit list Alright guys, let's get it started with the fight signings that have happened since we last left you. First, the UFC on Fuel TV 9 from Stockholm, Sweden coming at you April 6 from the Ericsson Globe Arena tough 17 castmates adam sella and tor trong have been added to the card that's the first time that that's ever happened in the ufc history where before an ultimate fighter finale we get a look at some of the contestants that are still on the show while it's being aired that's pretty interesting do, do you know why it's uh, because Tor's Tor's from, from sweden, sweden. yeah he's, the a Hama. Big, he's a big big draw over there he's a big local celebrity so I, that's why i think they did that I agree. I think that was definitely the reason. Also, UFC on Fox 7 was finalized today and added to that card. TJ Dillashaw and Jordan Meehan, both fresh right off their fights from UFC 158, both with wins. TJ will be facing Hugo Viana from Tough Brazil 1. Wolverine. Yeah. That was his name on the show. That's how they say Wolverine in Brazil. Wolverine. And he actually wore his Wolverine trunks at the weigh-in for the uh, last Ultimate Fighter that he fought in. I thought that was pretty awesome. Looked like he fought with his claws, too, the way he went after that dude. (laughs) (laughs) So that fight will be April 20th in San Jose, California. Oh, wait, wait. So uh, uh, the Mian fight, though. Oh, yeah. No, I wasn't there yet. Oh, my bad. Yeah, no, that's all good. I was just letting you know where it's at. April 20th. San Jose, California, the HP Pavilion. Um, with Jordan Meehan, we're going to see him face Matt Brown, the immortal. Sick. He is coming in for the injured Dan Hardy. I was juiced about Dan Hardy versus Matt Brown. I thought that was going to be amazing. But, you know, uh, Jordan Meehan's a friend of the show. He's been on here. We followed his career through Strike Force and up into the UFC when he just took out the season. The 13 fight veteran of the UFC, Dan Miller. He made it look easy. I am so stoked to see this fight. This is going to be a shootout. Absolutely. I was real pumped for the Dan Hardy, Matt Brown fight. But Jordan Mean, I mean, what he did the other night against uh, Dan Dan Miller was one of those things. Miller had never been stopped. Never been stopped. And Mean made it look easy easy we had talked about it before we talked about it last week about the elbows that he throws about the the viciousness and the finishing and uh, killer instincts he has and you saw it the other night and you also saw how much his ground game has improved absolutely in a slick arm bar he got caught and he pulled him he composed himself got himself out of it him against matt brown gonna be an awesome fight and another guy that's never been knocked out he's been submitted but never knocked out matt no brown. yeah he's yeah the, he's got they both have granite chins and in holes past holes in the submission game that they both look like they both made the improvements of their games to to make those strengths now brown against swick he got oh, caught, yeah. almost got caught Absolutely. in the submission and, and you saw him work through that and a revitalized career we talked about matt brown he was 12 and 12 when he came you know a, a few months ago or a few like a year and a half ago now he's 15 and 12 so he's on like a four fight win streak he's definitely put it all together S- exciting fight and then just a couple more announcements. We have at UFC 159, former Strike Force featherweight Kurt Hollibaugh versus uh, Steven Seiler after Jimmy Hedges got injured and he had to withdraw from that fight. I like it. I like Seiler. He's slick. He, he's tough everywhere. He's well-rounded. Um, it'll be a good fight. Yes, definitely. And that one's in April 27th in New Jersey. And for the UFC news, we have the Ultimate Fighter announcing that it, I mean, sorry, the UFC announcing that it will return to the Key Arena for UFC on Fox 8, July 28th. And that'll be um, probably, hopefully, I want to see the return of Demetrius Johnson maybe facing John Moraga in the main event. There's nothing signed to the card yet, but that's something to keep an eye on since he was supposed to uh, clash with them for the Tough 17 finale. Also, the Ultimate Fighter tomorrow night. Don't forget that we're going into the quarterfinals. Team Jones and Team Sonnen are all knotted up at 4-4. Four and four. Kevin Gastelum, Kelvin, excuse me, Gastelum versus Colin Hart. And Dylan Andrews versus Luke Barnett. There will be some special appearances from Ronda Rousey and Mike Tyson. FX, 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. 
Do not miss it. And I got to tell you what, uh, I, I'm loving the quarter. I'm loving the season of the Ultimate Fighter, but I love the quarterfinals because we get two fights per show. Yeah, it, best season of the Ultimate Fighter we've seen, and uh, it's just uh, now we're, we're we're closing in on the end, and we get to see Uriah Hall fight again. That's what I am so excited for. This kid is a beast. And you know what? I mean, I don't know if, if, if you guys are onto this yet, but do, don't you have to agree that he is the mystery fighter that Dana was talking about? I, I mean, it it's kind of hard not to think, but let's be honest. It's happened in the past where guys have come, been talked about as being the next You're big thing. You're thinking about Philippe Nova. Okay, but he was talking about after the show, coming off the show. That there was uh, there was uh, this kid who's amazing, but this one Dana stated some facts. He 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 uh, he said that he knocks everyone out he faces. One kid has a panic attack. So so who knows what's going to happen post career? I'm just wondering if he is. I think he is the mystery man, the the death dealer, the person who makes a fighter have a panic attack on the show because he's so afraid to fight him. I think it's Uriah Hall. He makes me have a panic attack, and I don't even have to. I just sit on my couch <laughs> and watch him. Well, we got to wrap up. Be sure to tune in Tuesday 9 p.m. FX. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. We want to give, again, a big shout-out to our sponsor, Dr. Richmond Ro Richard Rothman and LASIK of Nevada. Don't forget to check out their web website. It's LASIKofNV.com, and the phone number is 702-948-8283. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. This is the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920, broadcasting worldwide on UFCRadio.com. Very excited about this, UFCRadio.com! Boom, baby. Ready for it.